ஹரே கிருஷ்ணா மதுவான் ப்ரூ அமரேந்தர் ப்ரூ வெல்கம் வெல்கம் பேக் டு தி மாங்ஸ் பாட்காஸ்ட் திஸ் இஸ் பிகமிங் மோர் ஃபேமஸ் அஸ் த கோபி கீத் பாட்காஸ்ட் அண்ட் நாட் த மாங்ஸ் பாட்காஸ்ட் நோ யூ இட் இஸ் ரெஃபரிங் டு இட் தட் வே ஸோ தேங்க் யூ வெரி மச் ஃபார் ஜாயினிங் அண்ட் மதுவான் ப்ரூ வுட் யூ லைக் டு லீட் வித் மங்களாச்சரன் கோராக்ருகன்யகனோச்சுகோருஹாரம் கோரங்கூரச்சமோப்பிரிஷம் கோபாலோரீடோயோலா ஜோரங்கோரங்கோரங்கேரநாமுரேஜனோரங்கஜேஷேவாஜிலபியமாஜ சஸ்மை ஜன்மங்களமங்களைய நமோ நமஸ்தேத்தன்ய நமோ நமஸ்தேத்தன்ய நமோ நமஸ்தே விஸ்வநாத் சக்கரவர்த்தி தாக்கூர் ஹி கிவ்ஸ் அ கன்க்ளூடிங் காமெண்ட் ஆன் த டென்த் கேன்ட் டு த பாகவதம் மத்காவிரப்பி கோபாலாஸ்வீக்கிரியாத்ரிபயஜுரி It's a prayer to Gopal. My dear Gopal, you're famous as a cowherd boy. You take care of the cows. So you please accept and maintain the cows in the form of my words. And you get the pleasure, please, of drinking the milk from those cows. And you inspire other people to do the same. Shri Krishna Krishna Chaitanya Sasanatana Rupaka கோபாலாகுநாத்தாபிரஜபாலபாஹிமாஞ்சோபத்தூபிஷ்ச்சிபாஷிந்தூபியோவைஷ்ணவேபியோ நமோ நம ஜயஸ்ரீகிருஷ
of those uh, thievery. And uh, the first one is, it sounds a little confusing to me, and I just wondered if, if uh, Amarinda Prabhu wanted to comment on that. Um, his first aspect of the thievery is expressed in the, uh, that the lake is pure, and the lotus growing in the, the lake, therefore it's pure. The, 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 the lake is pure, it's producing the lotus. So it has a pure birth, sadhu jatta, and the qualities and form of the lotus are also pure and proper, sat, saraj, sat, uh, sarasja. So I, I, that's not real clear to me how that relates to Krishna's expression of being, being a thief, how he doesn't consider the great fault in taking the wealth of the righteous. Any comments on that, Amarinda Prabhu? Sure, Prabhuji. Um, <clears throat> so the words that the gopis use are Sharad Udashaye, Sadhu Jatasat, Sarasi Jodhara, Shri Mushadrisha. So Sharad refers to the autumn season. And Uda, as we know, is water. And Ashaya means the reservoir. So Sharad Udashaye, in the water, pond, let's say, Vrindavan is filled with ponds, lakes, uh, even rivers in the form of Manasi, Ganga, and Yamuna. In the, in the water ponds of Vrindavan, the lakes of Vrindavan, the small ponds of Vrindavan, the rivers of Vrindavan, during the autumn season, which is flooded with pure water post-monsoon, Sadhu Jat. Now, before we get there, I would like to, um, you know, reflect upon this word, Udashaye, the water reservoir, the pond. It's very interesting that in the Venu Geet, chapter 21, Shukadev Goswami starts off by describing the water ponds of Vrindavan. Ittam sharad swachha jalam padmakara sugandhina. Hmm. He says swachha jalam. Again, he, 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 before he gets to the air quality index of Vrindavan, talking about how pure the, the, the vayu is, he speaks about the water, the ponds. And uh, I heard from my, my beloved spiritual master that in Shastra, there is a custom of mapping or relating water ponds to the minds of great souls. Hmm. Why? Because they're still. They're without ripples. They're without tides. They're without agitation. And they give shelter to many living beings underneath in the form of fishes and small living beings in the water. Also, water is fragrant. It is free of contamination. And it's very cooling. And all these qualities relate to the mind of a sadhu. Point number one, he is without agitation. Point number two, like the river or the pond, he's ready to give shelter to others. Point number three, he's very cooling. In the sense that the heat of lust and anger and greed and pride and envy and jealousy, when we associate with a great soul, that fire is extinguished. So the water of his compassion from his pond-like mind extinguishes the fire of the anarthas. So it's very cooling. It's filled with lotus flowers, the mind of the sadhu, in the sense that the lotus flower represents the limbs of bhakti. So he's always performing shravanam, kirtanam, vishnu, smaranam, padasevanam, and they're all fragrant. He's, he's performing bhakti, not uh, vidhi mark, but rag mark, out of affection. And it has a lot of makaranda, a lot of honey, which attracts the bumblebee-like mind of Krishna. Mana manasa madhukaram, arpaya nijapada pankaja makarande, like Srila Rupa Goswami says. Also, it is free from contamination. There is no material desire. There's no mud. There's no dirt. There's no dust mixed in the water pond of the mind of a sadhu. There's no material desires. And most importantly, whatever he gains out of his bhajan, he doesn't ask a single drop for himself. Just like a pond doesn't drink a single drop of its own water. The mind of a sadhu is so pure that he doesn't drink a drop of all that he has gained out of his bhajan for his own benefit. So it's very interesting that the gopis start off by saying that the pond is a representative or a representation of saintly Reservoir. It's, it's a place of saintly behavior. It's a, it's a place of saintly qualities. And in that, the progeny, the offspring, the child is the lotus. So naturally in such Sharad season, 
where the mind is very calm the autumn season is very pleasing and especially the water pond in the middle of the forest now that's another interesting connection sadhus like to live in the middle of the forest <laughs> so the pond is in the middle of the forest with maunam it's not talking a word to anyone maunam vidwana bhushanam sanskrit says that the how do you recognize someone who's scholarly he is always grave he's not blabbering too much so vidwana bhushanam the ornament of a vidwan is silence gravity he has poise he has the the depth so the pawns of brindavan are considered uh, in in that equal to be sadhus and therefore naturally after sharad udashaye which is the family lineage the lotus is described as sadhu jata the lotus has appeared in the family of sadhus <laughs> in the pond sadhu jata and not just that sometimes you see that someone is born in a wonderful family but doesn't carry those qualities there are so many examples of people born uh, in saintly brahmanical divine lineage but they turn up to be ravana and kumbhakarna on the other hand you could have someone born as the son of hiranyakashipu to become prahlad maharaj but here interestingly the gopis are saying the place is perfect the time is perfect the family lineage is perfect and look at the child who's coming the lotus sadhu jata sat the the family is wonderful the parenting is wonderful the lineage is saintly and the children are also lotus like you see lotus is the sign of opulence and beauty so there's a glorification of krishna that your eyes are so beautiful certainly there is glorification that your eyes are so beautiful that they put the lotus to shame but how have your eyes become beautiful they don't have the beauty in them it has gotten beautiful because you have stolen from the lotus and the lotus is very saintly the pond is very saintly they don't even do anything wrong to you they are just saints in the middle of the forest doing bhajan and you out of nowhere you're so heartless you're coming and stealing the the treasure of the lotus and adding pleasure to your own eyes so if that is how so it's almost like the chandra shakha nyay to to men to to mention more glory of the of the moon or to hint to the moon the indication to the branches of the tree are made that the branch so can you see the branch yes can i see the branch yes so now look between the branch so it's almost like the gopis are telling us that or or telling krishna in this regard that if this is what you can do as your nature to those who are so nice they are in shantaras they are peaceful the pond is peaceful the lotus is peaceful they are collecting their beauty and you heartlessly come and steal it away so how much more will you steal from those girls who are already agitated by the uh, by the agitation of separation the kam agni and we ourselves are coming to you you have stolen everything away from us but you are heartless because when you steal it from the lotus you at least accept the lotus your eyes are lotus you stole it from your eyes but you kept the lotus with you but you're so heartless you stole our heart but you didn't keep us with you so you are you are a heartless thief you are you see no fault in stealing from whomever whenever however whichever and you go about swarat independently doing whatever you want to so it's almost like a complaint that if this is what you can so it's like saying um um if if the child at the age of 10 can memorize the whole bhagavad gita imagine how much he can do when he's 25 to say that if this is what he can do to lotus in the pond in the middle of the night in the middle of the forest those who just mind their own business they don't even talk a word to anyone and you go around stealing their property to increase your beauty you heartless son of nanda maharaj if that's what you do to the lotus what how much more you will do to the gopis of brindavan they don't even come in front of you you go to them and you steal and we are coming to you we are not righteous if you can do that to the sadhus if you can if you can hurt like for example if someone can offend a vaishnav an uttam adhikari imagine what he could do to a madhyam or a kanishta or someone who's not a devotee <laughs> so if you can do this to the lotus how much more can you do it to just girls of brindavan so we are not righteous they are righteous and lotus is always seen reverentially for worship and you go around stealing you know from their property so imagine how much more you could do to us they live in their house well protected in the middle of the forest and you go and you do that from a distance and you come close to us 
we leave our home we are so much more vulnerable and we are not even righteous mm. so how heartless is that so i don't know if i'm still uh, able to put the point across uh, my uh, you know I, i'm that sorry for I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for if if I'm beating around the bush, please forgive me. But it, it's not it's not uncommon in this section of the, the Bhagavatam in this chapter. The, the gopis they're saying buri dajana that uh, you, you're very magnanimous. Whoever's speaking this kata, and also that uh, you, you're you're killing everyone. That's your nature, Krishna. So I, I, it makes sense to me. It's nice nice analogy. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. I I was Thanks. just thinking. I I was also going over the. Chaitanya Mata Manjusa commentary of Srinath Chakravarti, uh, interesting person. He, he, he wrote the first Gaudiya commentary on the Bhagavatam. He's a priest of Shivananda Sain. And he says in, in connection with these same points, he's saying that the gopis are in effect are saying that you've been killing us with your glance, stealing our life, meaning that, that if you don't show up before us, we're going to die because this glance takes away the beauty of the lotuses. It's also been taking away our life. We're like land lotuses. So you've been killing us with this glance, stealing our life. Or so we're asking you to become visible, just like in homeopathy, you, you give some, uh, the same poison that you've gotten, the same disease, that's the medicine. So your glance is the poison, and that's also the medicine that we, we want you to become visible before us. Sheena Chakravarti is commenting like that. I, I found it also interesting in this section uh, of, of the, this verse, how the, the gopis, someone may question, how is it that they remain alive? And uh, Sanatan Goswami, later on in uh, the 46th chapter of the 10th canto, he says there's three reasons why the gopis were able to continue living. Maita prayasam prishte. Krishna is saying this because I'm the most cherished object of their love. So Krishna himself is giving them life. And the second reason was pratyagamane sandeshar because I promised ayasya. I said ayasya when Krishna was leaving. He said I'm going to return. And that promise, as Chaitanya Charan Prabhu was noting previously in the Lita Madhav, Radharani says that this is a bolt on the door, keeping my pranapashu, the, the, the life of my, uh, the animal of my life within the house, uh, because you promise that you're going to return. And Madatmika is the third reason, because they're fully dedicated to me. And there's also an interesting discussion my Guru Maharaj gives, which I think is based on Vishwanath's commentary, how the gopis are still living, although Krishna's killing them. And uh, Krishna says that, that during the, the autumn season, during the summer season, excuse me, when the, the sun is so intense, then we're hearing about the, these beautiful reservoirs of water. All those reservoirs, they dry up. And there's turtles there, just like the, some of the devotees we work with in, in Govardhan. They recently dug a, a big uh, pukur to catch the rainwater so that they can transfer the land. And they were very delighted shortly after, shortly after it filled up with water, almost immediately they, they found a turtle living in the water there. So those turtles are quite common. And, uh, but during the summer season, the lakes dry up. And how do those turtles stay alive? They're going to die. There's no water. It's become so hot that Viraha Tapa, the, the uh, fire of separation, is very like a scorching heat of the summer season. So in their pond, the heart of that, uh, their heart is like a pond, like Sarasi, and the water is completely dried up. So their life, Krishna says, is like pranakurma. It's like this, this turtle. So they stay alive by burying themselves in the mud. And that mud is the hope that I'm going to return. Again, yasam, asam ridam, asrita, pranakurma vasanti. Rupa Goswami describes that Uddhava Sandesh. That uh, that's how the gopis, they stay alive, by burying themselves very deep in the mud of this hope that I'm going to return. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, God. The turtle actually, as a metaphor, comes in many places, isn't it? It's the Bhagavad Gita at a basic level. It comes with drawing the senses, pulling. Yeah. But it is, turtle as burying is quite 
<laughs> I have never heard of that metaphor. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu also withdraws his. It said he becomes Kurma, what is described in separation from Krishna. That's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. But a turtle burying is I haven't heard that in any other context. It's beautiful. Have you, Amarinder Kumar, turtle burying as such? No, Prabhuji. It's it's yeah. just nectarian to hear uh, mm. what I just heard. It's so beautiful. <laughs> uh, it's painful for the gopis, but. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful comparison. Let's see if I can find something real quick. Maybe I can't find it so quickly on my computer. But we, we made a, a painting of that also, of the turtles. And I, I don't have my book here with me to show you. Anyway, it's, it's going to take me a minute to find it. I, I can, if you want, I can, I can still look it up. I can show in a minute. But uh, sure. it's not a quick thing right now. So the so the I mean the first so of the gopis, they stay alive for Krishna's sake, and in one sense, in the Gopi Geet, this is a bigger question which I had. In the Gopi Geet, it's mostly about the emotions of Krishna, sorry, emotions of the gopis, and it's almost as if Krishna comes out as a bad guy over there. <laughs> hey, if you if you enable me, I'll, I'll show this painting we 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 made. Oh, wonderful! Share the screen. Yes, sir. Okay, let's see here. I just had it. Yeah, I think it's that one. Yeah, can you see that? Okay. Oh, and this is kind of a symbol. This is Patachitra painting, but uh, you can see the, the turtles representing the gopis in this dried-up lake. They, they, they're moving deeply into the mud under the hot sun. Hmm. Amazing. Was, so you got you got this made yourself? Yeah, yeah. This in Mathura meets Vrindavan, we had almost all the paintings made special for the book. I don't know, there's like a fifty paintings or something in the book. Amazing. Hmm. So it's okay. not just it's not just mud. It's mud under the water. It's this is the, gone into the river bed or something like that. That's. And and the lotus, what's the what's the phrase? My my brain's not working so good. I'm around render you're saying the lotus. It appears out of it. It appears out of the mud. Hmm. Pankaja. Yeah. Pankaja. So janja janma. It's that, that thing which pankaja. So that mud, <laughs> the gopis may say this is this is very cloudy. This is the mud has this this quality of, of uncertainty of, of darkness, but it's also cooling, and <laughs> that's the mud of the hope that uh, Krishna may come back again. And that's the thing which is keeping the gopis alive. Uh-huh. And I'm also thinking, um, Krishna as a thief is being compared here by the gopis. Uh, you know, how he's expertly stealing from the, the lotus. But uh, it's just a personal reflection. A thief in this world steals Lakshmi, mm. right? Wealth. But Krishna is stealing from the Lakshmis. <laughs> right? Lakshmi Sahasra Shata Sambrahma Sevya Manam Govinda Madhi Purusham Tamaham Bhajami. That Lord who's being served by millions and millions of Lakshmis, that Lord is stealing from the source of all Lakshmis, the gopis of Vrindavan. Amazing. Padmalankrit. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Padmalank. Padmalankrita Pani Pallava Yugam Padmasanastham Shriyam Vatsalyadi Guno Jwalam Bhagavatim Vande Jagan Matham. Lakshmi Devi has been described as the embodiment of auspiciousness, as the embodiment of all good fortune. And she is always compared to the lotus. Padmalankrita, her decoration is that of lotus. Padmalankrita, her ornaments are that of lotus. Padmalankrita, Pani Pallava, her hands and her feet, her palms and her feet are like lotus. And Padmasana, she sits in Padmasana on a Padma with a Padma in her hand. Padma meaning lotus. So she's completely decked up with lotus. And our Shastra describes that Ladinera Sar Prem Prema Sara Bhav, Bhavera Parama Kashta Nama Mahabhav, Mahabhava Swarupa Shri Radha Thakurani, Sarva Gunakani, Krishna Kanta Shiromani. Of all the consorts of the Lord, the gopis headed by Radharani are the source from where innumerable Lakshmi is manifest. So it's very interesting 
the thieves of this world they try to steal the perverted reflection of lakshmi wealth not even the true lakshmi the perverted reflection like ravana it was maya sita it was not actual sita mm. the thieves are searching and stealing the perverted reflection of the true lakshmi and krishna is stealing from the source of all lakshmis so think about the chauragra ganya Uh, purusham namami the the uh, source of all um, theft <laughs> yeah if we could say at one level that the for lakshmi it is krishna who is the greatest wealth isn't it nadanam janana sundarim we say that i don't want anything else but what i want lord is you so so that which even lakshmi considers to be the greatest wealth her greatest wealth krishna is taking that away from her Mm. and he got he is taking that away from the gopis and at the same time in once maybe probably later in another verse we'll talk about how even in separation there is presence in fact there is intensified presence like we discussed that briefly but at that point there is a feeling of complete bereavement emptiness so there is a, everything that i have everything that i live for is taken away mm. so krishna takes it away from them and in the chaitanya charitamrit Is it Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says to is it Shri Vas Thakur that that even if the Lakshmi Devi has to beg from house to house, still there will be no shortage in your house. Hmm. He says that when even after his son dies, he continues performing the kirtan, so he is completely dependent. So that situation is not exactly the same. Lakshmi begging from house to house, but the gopis are actually begging in one sense, searching where is Krishna? They are going from tree to tree, forest to forest, one. Hmm. In, in one sentient being in the forest asking them hmm. so krishna is uh, in one sense uh, reduced the supreme goddesses of fortune to a state of utter desolation <laughs> <laughs> um but but i i i would i would like to see it like this that the gopis are like gold Mm. and krishna is throwing the gold into fire to make it molten mm. vishwanath uses that same example he he raises a question he says that, that someone may ask how is it possible that krishna is putting the gopis into such distress if he really loves the gopis then why did he leave vrindavan why mm. doesn't he come back it may seem like he loves the residents of mathura dwarka more the bridge go because and, and the answer is, is basically what you were just saying that just as a goldsmith shows the value of the gold by heating it so with this vipralamba agni with this fire separation krishna is also melting the hearts of the gopis and thereby glorifying them hmm huh? ye pratyatu sadana krishna hmm. says in, in the 10th canto that, that let your own uh, let your own behavior be your your glory huh mm. that's you you know there is this i, I think poetically this can uh, poetically on the flip side on the other side of fire is water and poetically if we could even say that almost like the gopis are telling krishna krishna you are stealing the lotus of our hearts from the pond of love and throwing it into the ocean of sorrow with the salty water of the tears of separation so you're stealing the lotus of our hearts from the pond of love and throwing it into the ocean of sorrow with the salty water of the tears of separation hurts <laughs> so it's a it's a double metaphor to convey their pain actually fire is one pain and then Yeah, I was thinking. I've just been reading Gopal Champu, and there are several intriguing parallels with Ram Lila that he brings about. One of the things you mentioned is how mm, there was Maya Sita, uh, who Ravan has stolen, and then Jiu Jiu Goswami also talks about how uh, there were the Maya Gopis or Chaya Gopis, which appeared. So the chaya gopis were who were married to Ab- abhimanyu and other men and the real gopis were they were married to krishna so there are many parallels like that in that but one parallel struck me i'm not sure whether it's mentioned in gopal shambhu but 
what you there is this, in the ramayan there is this tension between duty and love and in the here also for krishna there is a tension between duty and love so in the ram is in the forest and bharat comes to tell him that you know please come back it is for you to become the king as a, this one of the most uh, endearing conversations in the rama and uh, at least for me so bharat says that you know you come back he says no my our father had told that i had to be in the exile so he says no but he had told but now he had told because he wanted to please kai kai and she is telling come back and she says no it is his word and i couldn't do anything for him throughout my life at least now i'll honor his word he said <laughs> Yeah, he says no. You know, it actually, you know, if at all you want to honor the word, you honor him by taking the kingdom that he has protected. I cannot do it. And if you feel your father's word, our father's word will be honored, I will stay in the forest, and you go back to the kingdom. So then, finally, he says that, you know, we cannot. Everybody has to. Everybody has to go through their own karma. Ram says, if we don't, if we try to interchange karma arbitrarily, the whole universal order will be thrown into chaos. so i'll have to um, take my karma and this is your duty you go back and finally uh, bharat says that it is all no logic works for him he says i am not going back he says i am going to sit here in meditation till you agree to come back and then finally <laughs> ram says so, so the ramayan commentator explain that this is actually in once in the tension between duty and law so uh, lord ram is in one now motivated by sense of duty to his father i had i had to honor his word mm-hmm. but bharat is motivated it, it, it he's not it's not duty it's such, he has already been giving the kingdom he said my duty is to to rule the kingdom which has been given to me i didn't seek it i got it but it's out of love for his elder brother he says no you should take the kingdom so love goes beyond duty so finally lord ram says to bharat you know you win you won and i am defeated says you came here to give me the kingdom i accept it and bharat's face blossoms like a lotus and he's so delighted and then lord ram very sweetly turns around he says uh, i accept the kingdom that you gave to me and i entrust the kingdom to you for 14 years and now you take the kingdom and you rule on my behalf so then bharat bharat is disappointed he says that lord ram has outwitted me so he says but i want some token that uh, i am ruling on your behalf and then he gives us padukas so similarly in i was i was mentioning this point that it's from the gopi gita perspective it almost appears as if like krishna is the bad guy but in gopal champu uh, krishna's plight and krishna's agony is also described when krishna goes to vrinda goes from vrindavan to mathura at that time krishna he at the jugo swami stated krishna has full intention of coming back but then the yadus they tell no you know who will protect us from kamsa and you are our son and it is your you have fulfilled the prophecy of killing kamsa therefore uh, who, who you have to stay with us and you have to protect us from the allies, allies of krishna so then krishna feels torn and he has to stay there so in one sense for krishna it's a duty which for duty will for lord ram duty keeps him in the forest but for krishna duty keeps him away from the forest of vrindavan duty keeps him in the city lord ram duty keeps him away from the city but at that time also there is this tension between duty and love so and then so i think uh, jiva swami says over there when krishna left vrindavan he actually left himself in the hearts of the gopis So just as Lord Ram gave a paduka, there's nothing physical, no physical memento he gave, but he left himself in the hearts, and the inter- remembrance of the gopis became much more. And also, he also says that uh, that uh, there are I forget the name. There are two gopas who look like Krishna and Balaram. So they say, how will the cow? We will understand. Nanda Maharaj says, but how will the cows understand? How will they stay in separation from you? so what they do is these two gopas krishna says they take out their upper garments and they give this these garments will have our smell and these two gopas look like us so let them wear those garments and let them go to the cows so in that way krishna in one sense while 
fulfilling the call of duty also tries to fulfill the need of love he cannot he is also torn so krishna is we may call him as a thief but it's not that krishna is the bad guy krishna is also torn between duty and love so the paduka in that sense is his he he sticks to duty but he does not neglect love so similarly krishna also he sticks to his duty but he enters into the hearts of his devotees that's how he also answers the call of call of love and he also for the cows gives his outer garments how beautiful how beautiful can i add something if that is okay prabhuji please certainly i am i am um, reminded of the chaitanya charitamrita um since we spoke about uh, i i really uh, caught one sentence where you said that even krishna feels pain hmm? even krishna is feeling the agony so in the chaitanya charitamrit we find in the i believe in the 13th chapter of madhya leela uh, the meeting of radha and krishna at kurukshetra is described hmm. and long story but uh, they are seeing each other after or meeting each other after 100 years of separation radha and krishna at kurukshetra and in the discussion shrimati radharani is asking krishna um how is it that i was alive in your separation how is it that i didn't die because wherever there is true love there cannot be separation and if there is separation that is not eternal and if there is separation in true love the person dies <laughs> so there is separation and this is true love and i have not died in separation from you so how is it that i was alive and krishna answers that in the words of shila krishna das kaviraj goswami by saying rakhi te to mara jeevan sevi ami narayan tar shakti ashe niti niti o radhika o radharani i know you would have died in separation from me but i did something for you to protect you rakhi te to mara jeevan to protect your life here in the body sevi ami narayan i used to worship the deity of narayan every day krishna is saying sevi ami narayan i used to worship narayan every day and narayan appeared before me being pleased by my worship and he asked me what do you want i said just keep radhika alive oh narayan if you really want to give me anything krishna is praying to narayan if you really want to give me something please keep my radharani alive don't let her die so narayan says that is for sure ask something for yourself krishna says i don't want anything if you really want to give me something give me a power by which i can run to vrindavan every single day of my life so krishna is telling radharani rakhi te tumara jeevan o radhika just to protect you sevi ami narayan i worship narayan every day and tar shakti by his blessings ashe niti niti i could come every sunset to brindavan i ran from dwarka every evening to brindavan and then what did you do in brindavan o krishna as radhika so then krishna said tuma sane krida kori i performed fast times with you every night and niti jao jadu puri and when the sun was about to rise i used to run back to dwarka every night i came to brindavan o radharani for you and all night i was dancing and singing and playing with you and when the sun was about to rise i would run back to dwarka but then radharani said how is it that i never recognized krishna with tears said tuma sane krida kori niti jao jadu puri sei tume mane mora spurti o radharani you just considered that to be my spurti you considered that to be hallucination from your heart but trust me i was actually there every sunset i left all the dwarka vasis and i ran to brindavan by the power of narayan he blessed me with that and i used to come and play with you sing with you 
dance with you. Oh, Radhika, do you remember? Do you remember that night when you saw me? And then you felt that was just hallucination and you were convinced it's a tamal tree? Actually, you were wrong. He was not a tamal tree. He was me standing for you in the shape of a tamal tree. I had come in person. And oh, Radharani, every night I was there with you. Every sunset, I would run for you. And every sunrise, I would run away back to do my duties. So the whole verse in Chaitanya Charitamrit goes like this. Raki te tumara jivan, to save your life. Sevi ami Narayan, I prayed to Narayan. Tara Shakti, Ashe Niti Niti. By his blessings, Narayan's blessings, I used to come every night. And Tumashane Krida Kori, I performed pastimes with you. Niti Jao Jadu Puri. And I ran back to Dwaraka. Say to me, Mane Moras Purti. Radhe. Say to me, Mane Moras Purti. Oh, Radhika, unfortunately, you thought that was my Spurti. But actually, I came. And because I used to come, that kept you alive. Amazing. This is beautiful. Madhavantru, you want to add something? It's digesting that. It's so nice. Very, very important topic. How it is that uh, Krishna was meeting with the gopis every day. In Gopal Champu, uh, Krishna writes a letter to Radharani from Mathura. And he says that, that uh, you, every day, you, Radharani, you're having this dream that uh, we're together. And you think it's just a dream. But you should know that, that there's some fragrance on the sheets from my body that's there. It's, it's really actually happening. And that's an amazing thing. Uh, is it, I think it's uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He describes three different types of love in Braj. Mm -hmm. The uh, it, it's Jiva Goswami in Lagu Vaishnav Tosh, and he says that there's Utkanta Pradhan. And Utkanta Pradhan, that's Prema, which the Pradhan, the, the quality of it is it has, it's Utkanta, it has this longing, this intensity. And that's possessed by Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yashoda and the gopis of Braj. And then there's Vishramba Pradhan which Vishramba means some familiarity, some friendship, and that's prema with the predominance of that familiarity, that's Krishna's friends, the suckers. And then there's Viveka Shunya Pradhan, and that's prema that has no discrimination, and that's the cows <laughs> and the plants of Vrindavan. So the quality of the love of the gopis is Utkanta Pradhan. They have this very, very intense longing and Jiva Goswami even explains that the cowherd boys and the cows, they think that Krishna is present. That they see some spurti of Krishna and they think it's his direct form and they can't distinguish between the two. Mm -hmm. But therefore, it's only the gopis and the parents, uh, he's saying in one sense, that they feel separation. Mm -hmm. Because they have this utkanta pradhan, which is very intense feeling. And even if they see some spurti, they don't believe it. No, this is, this is not actually true. And therefore, Krishna, when he wrote that letter to Radharani, he said, no, this is actually happening. Amazing. Now, I was also thinking that this spurti, it also is there in Chaitanya Charitamrut, isn't it? I think when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tells Damodar Pandit to go from Puri to... Uh, Mayapur back, and he takes some, they'll take some prasad for the Mayapur Vasis, including Sachimata. Is it Damodar Pandit or I'm not Jagadan so Pandit? Sorry? Gadadar Jagadan Pandit. Yeah, Jagadan Pandit, right, right, right. So he says that when tell Mother, tell Mother Shachi that when she makes her offerings <laughs> to me, uh, to, and then she comes back and his offering has disappeared. She thinks, oh, she thinks because of my old age, I, have, I probably forgot to make the offering. And she goes and makes the offerings again. Since you did not forget to make the offerings, I actually did. I who personally came and took the offerings. So I was honoring the offerings, and that way I was with you. So Jiva Goswami says a similar thing in Gopal Champu, also. Again, when Krishna writes this letter, he there's a series of letters going back and forth between 
Mathura and, and later Dwarka and uh, Vrindavan and Bridge Basis. And Krishna writes a letter to Mother Yashoda. And he says that, that, that uh, you, you think you're going mad because you're cooking these things and it disappears. It's like Sachimata. And he says, but it's not true. He says, the first day you made sweet rice. And the second day you made this preparation. He, des- he described all the different preparations <laughs> that she made and what day. <laughs> and he said, I'm coming in and I'm personally taking these things. So she's having a spurti, but that's the quality of, of that Utkanta Pradhan love that they don't believe it. <laughs> their, their, their feelings are so intense, they don't believe it's actually happening. That's amazing. You know, in one sense, the Sahaja devotees, if they are not necessarily as Indian, but if we have a vision of Krishna, you want to doubt <laughs> it to the whole world. You know, Krishna came <laughs> in my dream, and this I saw Krishna. But they see Krishna and they think, oh, it's not Krishna, actually. Mm. That's a beautiful point. You know, we could really elaborate on that, too, that our sadhana, we're trying to follow the gopis. And although we're just following Vaidhi Bhakti at this time, still, Gopi Ed Guru Matmana, Sanatana Goswami, Hari Bhakti Vilas, he quotes Samoe and Tantra, we should hide our guru. Gopi Anija Malakam, we should hide our mala. We should hide our bhajan. Narutam Das Thakur speaks like that in Prem Bhakti Chandra because they don't just go here and there speaking about it. Because we're, we're aspiring for something very, very high. But there, there's an interesting conversation Prabhupada had with some devotees in Bhubaneshwar here in Orissa in 1977 when Prabhupada last came. And somebody was telling him, he said, Prabhupada, there's some of your disciples and they say that, that they're in touch with some space aliens some of your disciples, <laughs> and they're seeing this thing and that thing. <laughs> we, we printed this in our Bindu magazine some years ago, and Prabhupada became very disgusted. And he said, this is Sahajya. And he gave a few funny examples. He said, just like I had one barrister friend who went to Vrindavan, and, uh, and when he was in Vrindavan, some boy asked him for a sweet, and so the, the lawyer gave him some sweet. And then later he said he saw the same boy on the train and he realized that was Krishna. <laughs> and he's telling Prabhupada that. And then another example he gave was here in Jagannath Puri. He said that there was one fat woman, wealthy woman, and she, they brought her before Lord Jagannath. They have an inner sanctum before Jagannath. And she's circumambulating Jagannath. And as she's circumambulating, she was telling Prabhupada later that, that Jagannath was catching my cloth. <laughs> and Baba said, this lady, she's so fat. <laughs> like, why, why does Krishna want to catch her cloth? And he said, this is Sahajiism. And so it, just like one devotee once told my Guru Maharaj, he said, Maharaj, I was chanting Hare Krishna, and I saw Lord Nishringadev. <laughs> and Guru Maharaj leaned into him and kind of whispered, and he said, don't tell anyone. <laughs> so that that's our, our mood is we're following the gopis and the word gopi the very word gopi comes from the same word guha or to hide something so the gopis are hiding their feelings and we're in that line we may be sadhiks we may be vaidhi bhaktas but still in this line we shouldn't advertise our feelings and, and, and Sanatan goswami gopal bhatta goswami hari bhakti bilas they explain that elaborately. If you have some amazing vision and a dream or something, don't tell anyone. Maybe you tell your guru, but that's the only person. And that's a very wonderful thing. It accomplishes a number of things. Just like uh, if you have a pot in, in a small room and it's full of water and you put it on a big fire, then the pot starts boiling and it looks really dramatic. The whole room becomes filled with, with steam. But the same pot, if you put a tight lid on it, it doesn't look very dramatic at all. But actually, <laughs> it's much, much more powerful because if you keep the, the lid tightly on that pot, at some point it's going to explode. And that's the nature of Sri Chaitanya Makod Girna Hare Krishna Tivarnika. Rupa Goswami says this is Mahaprabhu's bhajan, uh, that Jagat Premi, he, he's come and he's giving this prema to the whole universe to this holy name, but it's Mukod Girna. It's coming through his mouth just like a volcano that's exploding. So we should hide that thing and not, not to advertise it. If, if we advertise it, it's very bad for our, our discipline succession. It's very bad for our preaching. It's very bad for our society. But it's also very bad for us as individuals. We won't get to keep the treasures that we might have accumulated. And even it said that Gopi at Guru Matmana, that we should hide our guru, not meaning that we deny our guru, 
but we don't advertise our intimate connection with him. And that's a little hard sometimes for devotees to understand this principle because for many of us, our idea of preaching is that we advertise everything. You know, I was with my guru, Dave, and he told me this, and here's a photo of me and him, and I remember he, he, he and I did this. Or we tell people, now I, on the street, I've seen devotees. I'm chanting one lakh a day of this Hare Krishna mantra. It's so nice. You should do the same thing. And then sometimes devotees are thinking like that, that preaching means advertising my bhajan. But it, it's not, and that, that's a very detrimental thing for us. But this is a this is a whole. I mean, it's a whole, a whole subject actually. In one sense, that uh, there is the personal relationship and the personal emotions, and there is the preaching mission. So, in one sense, it is our purpose is to inspire others to develop their relationship with Krishna. But it's so subtle that instead of inspiring others to develop their relationship with Krishna, we start advertising our relationship with Krishna. Uh, and of course, in one sense, for, for people, we are an example. And our relationship with Krishna is also going to be an, an example for them. But it's, it's a subtle thing that, am I, is what am I doing? Is it inspiring them to develop their relationship with Krishna? Or is it simply inspiring them to, or making them become filled with how about my relationship with Krishna? So, the Prabhupada had that, Prabhupada was asked this question that, uh, have you seen God? And Prabhupada said, what does it matter whether I have seen God or not? I have, I have given you the process by which you will be able to see God. So it is more of what you can, don't, it's not what I have realized and we debate about what I have realized, but what you can realize. So, so it's a really important point. It's, it's something, I mean, we're, you know, I think we're getting a little off from our main subject, but just to touch on this. It's something that I'm very concerned about, that devotees think this is a kind of preaching. And sometimes even I've seen devotees publish things and they, they tell stories of some Muslim had a dream and the deity came to him and said, you should get your daughter married to such and such person. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm very reluctant to, to advertise that kind of thing because what, what the result is, is that people will take it cheaply. And they, start, they may start thinking that, that I can also do like this. And, and that, that's very detrimental for our, our preaching mission, for our personal budget, and for our society. Mm. Can, I, can I just go back to our topic a little yeah, bit? Please, please, yeah. definitely. Balabacharya, made, in his Sabodhani Tik, and Balabacharya writes an interesting commentary, and sometimes devotees, they think, oh, we shouldn't go to Balabacharya, he's in a different line, and Mahaprabhu said some little disparaging things about him, which actually, just from a historical point of view, uh, that conversation with Mahaprabhu, where he chastised Vallabhacharya, they don't accept that. And there's no yeah. historical pramana to support. Of course, we accept it because Krishna Das Kabir, Goswami says, but I'm personally a little reluctant to wear it on my t-shirt when I go and deal <laughs> with some of my friends in, in, in the line of Vallabhacharya. And Srila Bhakta Siddhanta, in one place, he says that we should study his Sabodhanitika. And he, in, in speaking about the second verse uh, of this Gopi Geet, he says that the word Sri Musha, huh? Sri Musha, which uh, Musha means something which it's greater than, and, and Sri means a beauty, but greater than also means indicates that it steals because it's greater, it, it takes away this thing, indicates that Krishna is such a thief, and it has become a killer. And that's the nature of a thief, a, a really good thief, someone who really progresses in the pathway of being a thief, they naturally become a killer. And then, and then the, the better the thief they are, the better they are at killing. And so <laughs> Balabhacharya is saying that Krishna's expertise in, in stealing is shown, very similar to what Jiva Goswami is saying, that he did this impossible act. This is like grand theft. This is greater than... than than stealing from the bank, because the beauty of the gopis is something that was concealed within sadhu jatta. It belonged to that lotus, and at the same time, it was with inside of the lotus, in the center of the lotus, and at the same time, that uh, lotus was surrounded by a moat, just like you have a, a, a castle or something that's surrounded by a moat. It's surrounded by that water, 
So that's an amazing thing that Krishna was able to steal. And on top of all that, the, the theft occurred during broad daylight. In, in warm weather where everybody was, was out and about and, and everybody could, uh, could see anything, but still nobody could see. This is, this is the depth of Krishna's stealing, uh, indicated by this word Sri Musha. Beautiful. I'm good. If everybody wants, we could go on to the next, the third verse. Yes. Unless Amarendra is being, being quiet, maybe has some reflections on this. <laughs> Can I, can I add a few yes. thoughts, Prabhuji? Yes, sir. Just one minute, if you don't mind. At Vallabhacharya, I recently, one devotee was very disturbed by that whole pastime. And I went through the whole pastime in Chaitanya Charita Amrut. And one thing struck me that it seems Lord Chaitanya's focus is, is not at all on critiquing the commentary. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu doesn't read the commentary at all. And it is also not so much on critiquing Vallabhacharya, although the words used seem to be quite strong. It seems to be more on emphasizing respect for Sridhar Swami. And it's more a principle that, that when we write a commentary, we shouldn't think that we are superseding or we are going above the previous Acharya. So if we take out the personalities over there, that Vallabhacharya, is, it's, it's more like a philosophical teaching of respect for the previous acharyas rather than a criticism of vallabhacharya per se so that's the sense i got when i read that past time because otherwise uh, they have very cordial dealings earlier even they meet in north india and then eventually i think um, i from there have been reasons for some friction between the two traditions the Madha and the Puri temple and other things. But overall, I don't think this pastime itself or the fallout of this pastime caused a significant friction. Uh, uh, historically speaking, that was a cause of any rupture between the uh, two past, uh, between the two sampradayas. In that sense, as you said, the more important than getting into the historic city of the pastime, I think it's the purpose of the pastime of respecting the previous acharyas. That is what was my sense, broadly speaking, of that past time. That's true. Yeah. Amarindra yeah. Prabhuji. Yes, Prabhuji. So, um, actually, one very wonderful commentator by the name Narayan Bhatta Goswami, he has mm -hmm. commented on this verse, on the word Kim Vadaha, which is the last word of the verse. Suratha Nathate Ashulka Dasika Varada Nignato Neha Kim Vada. So one meaning of the word Kim Vada is, is this not Vada? Is this not murder? Na iha Kim Vada? It's a question. It's a rhetorical question. It is murder. So it's like saying, is this not murder? You have been stabbing us repeatedly every single day with your glances. Now what else do you expect? Now you're, after all that stabbing, when, when someone comes and stabs us once, twice, thrice, the natural question is, why are you stabbing me? Do you want to kill me? That's the natural response. So, oh Krishna, you who stabs us with your glances. Now, what do you want? Is, is this not murder? That's a question. But however, Narayan Bhatta Goswami gives another meaning to the word Kim Vada. He says, according to the Sanskrit grammar, the word Kim Vada can also break as Kutsita Vada, which means even amidst the, the category of murder, this is the most disgusting murder that anybody can think about. Kutsita Vada. Kim Vada, one meaning is, is this not murder? But another meaning is that this is the most disgusting murders of all murders. Why? Some analysis has been given. The analysis is, if there is someone who is, let's say, a bad criminal, you can give him life imprisonment but then even the judge thinks twice before giving him a death sentence, right? However bad the cr criminal may be, if let's say he's repentant, uh, then the, the sentence is reduced. But let's say if he is, uh, is a complete, uh, as uh, Sripad Madhavananda Prabhu calls, badmash. Let's say the person is a total badmash, a gone case. Then the judge may say, well, lifelong imprisonment. But the judge will think twice before even killing such a person. So even bad criminals are thought about by the judge before they give a death sentence. How much more for a saintly man? A saintly man should never be killed. Is it not? 
he should never be killed. Then how much for a saintly woman? A woman should never be killed. Never. And how much more for women in the plural sense? Women should never be killed, never be attacked. They should be protected. So it's a category of murder that Narayan Bhatta Goswami takes us through a spectrum. He says a bad criminal may be killed, but even he's given a chance. A saintly man is never to be killed. A saintly woman in the singular sense, singular case, should never be killed. She should be protected and respected and honored. And then what about women? In the plural sense, they should always be protected and respected. And then how much more about the gopis? How much more about the gopis? Who are the, 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 the treasure or let's say the crown on top of womanhood? Gopis, ultimately, they are the best example. And what's happening here, the gopis in plural sense are being tortured on the banks of Yamuna, who's another gopi, who's another transcendental prakriti. And all of this is happening on Mother Earth, who's another woman. And all of this is happening in the forest of Brindadevi, who's another woman. And they're all saintly women. They're all gopis. Gopis should not be tortured. And that too now on the banks of the Yamuna, who's another you know, feminine body devotee. And that too on Mother Earth. That too in the forest of Brinda. And all of this headed by Sri Radha, who is Brindavaneshwari. And it is such a wonderful place that the queen of all queens and the woman of all women, that is Indira, Lakshmi Devi herself, she's coming to take shelter of this place. And amidst all that, which is you know, predominated by devotional women, and that too in the forest when they are helpless, and that too at nighttime when they are helpless, and that too they came lovingly living, giving up everything that they possessed just for you, Krishna. And what you want to do is reject them. So amidst all the murders, this can this is the kutsita vada. Kim vada is kutsita vada. Mm -hmm. This is the most disgusting murder scene. And what are the gopis saying? They are threatening Krishna. If we all die on Mother Earth, on the banks of Yamuna, in the forest of Brinda, headed by Radha, in the place taken shelter by Lakshmi, then all that defamy and all that sin will come to you. Mm -hmm. So please come out and save your own reputation. <laughs> <laughs> Protect yourself. And it's very interesting. Krishna is saying in the Gita, Aham tuam sarva pape mi that I will purify you of all your sins. I will help you. And here the gopis are threatening that Krishna of sin. <laughs> they are saying, we want you to come. Why? Not for us. But we are thinking about your repetition. We are thinking about so that you don't get the sin of killing us. You don't get the ill fame, the defamy from everyone of killing such saintly women. Therefore, come and also follow your own Bhagavad Gita, Baba. Follow your own Bhagavad Gita. The preacher should uh, practice what he preaches. Apanina kaila dharma shikhaina jai. The preacher is supposed to follow his own preaching. So what have you said in the Gita, O Krishna? That if you leave your hiding, that is the home, and come to meet me, then what, will I'm, what am I supposed to do? Give up my hiding and come to see you. Now what are you doing? We have given up our hiding, the home, and come to see you. And you've given up our association to go in the hiding. This is not Bhagavad Gita. This is not Bhagavad Gita. And also, we want you to come out and help us. Why? Because we are like the lotus. Back to the original example. We are like the lotus. And what nourishes the lotus? The sun and the moon. And what are the sun and the moon? Your eyes. <laughs> so the lotus of our life opens and expands by the sun and the moon. So we know there are two kinds of lotus. There's the day lotus and the night lotus. The day lotus, which is nourished by the sun, and the night lotus, which is nourished by the moon. And Krishna, your eyes are sun and moon, and we are the lotus. So come and nourish our life, because when the sun sets and doesn't rise, the lotus is going to wither, and the lotus is going to die. So the lotus of our life is withering in separation and almost dying because of the absence of the sun and moon of your glance. So, is it not 
Kim Vada, even the sun and the moon of this world don't do that. They set, but they rise also. But the sun and moon of your eyes, they have set, but they don't rise. <laughs> They're not coming and giving darshan. So, Kim Vada, is, it this, is this not the most disgusting example of murder? So, there was a, a small comment. Amazing. So, it's, you know, this lotus, the gopis are saying Krishna's eyes are like lotus. But at the same time, uh, that the gopis and their the gopis are like lotus, their hearts are like lotus. That is, uh, that is not necessarily said in this verse itself. But that is uh, like uh, for the metaphor of robbing and for these other metaphors that the devotees are like lotus, saintly people are like lotus and the gopis are topmost devotees. From that we have drawn the inference, isn't it? So there's two different metaphors. That's correct. That's mm. correct. On uh, with respect to Krishna's uh, thievery and 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 stealing propensity, then he can steal even from the lotus. So uh, at that time, our hearts are like lotus. Mm. But now the lotus <laughs> of our heart needs the sun rays and the moonbeams of your glance. So by uh, by denying us that, um, you know that's that's not right. And also thieves, if they can, as Sripad Madhavananda Prabhu was saying, if the if the if, if Krishna can steal so much during the day, <laughs> imagine how much he can do at night. <laughs> Daytime, Vraje Prasidam Navanita Choram, Gopanga Nanamcha Dukula Choram, Aneka Janmar, Jita Papa Choram, Chauragra Ganyam, Purusham Namami, Sri Radhikaye, Ridayasya Choram, Navambuda Sham, Alakanti Choram, Padashritanamcha Samasta Choram. If he can steal the complexion of Radhika in daylight, if he can steal the complexion of the cloud daylight, if he can steal the butter in the neighbor's house daylight, if he can steal the sins of his devotees during daylight, imagine what this thief can do at night. You know, this is a glorification of, of Krishna's ability to take sins away from the lives of his devotees. So, so the gopis are using the, the metaphor there. <laughs> Beautiful. So, so in one sense, in one metaphor, the lotus is the robber. In the other metaphor, the lotus is the robbed. So, <laughs> that's the right. Krishna, lotus is the Krishna's eyes. They are robbing the hearts of the gopis. So, right. in that sense, the lotus is the robber. And the second metaphor, gopis' hearts are like lotus or gopis are like lotus. So, they are being robbed. And the interesting thing is, Krishna is, um, he's saying, Samoham Sarva Bhuteshu. I'm equal to everyone, but there's some difference here. What's the difference? His eyes are stealing from the lotus, but he gives position of those lotus in his eyes. The eyes are always compared to the lotus. So the point is, I will steal from you, but then I will also accept you as a metaphor. Krishna is <laughs> <Okay. laughs> saying, I will steal the, the nectar from the wall of the lotus, but I will also accept the lotus as a comparison to my limbs. So the gopis are saying, if you can steal from the lotus, but what did you do? You stole from the lotus, but you accepted the lotus in your eyes. So you steal our heart, no problem, but accept us, keep us with you. But what you're doing is you stole from the lotus and kept the lotus in your eyes. But you're stealing from us and leaving us, rejecting us. At least if you want to steal, Baba, steal properly. At least keep us with you. Steal completely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. It's you stolen our hearts. You have called us to you. You have come to you. And now you are abandoning us. I think later on this will, this point about women will come in later was Kasteje Nishi. He talks about you know, how women have come to meet you at night. You are a hero. How can you abandon them? That point will come in later verse also. Yeah. But as Madhavantru, you want to add something? Or as you said, should we? Yeah, I, I was just really, thank you very much, Amarendra, for sharing that. that comments about the meaning of Kim Vada from Rainbata Goswami. That, that was very, very beautiful. And just to add something more to that, um, our commentaries also describe that what, what, an, what an unprecedented murder that you've done. And it's even worse because the gopis are Asoka Dasika. They're unpaid maidservants. And the gopis, they're telling Krishna, you, you looked at us just with one eye and you express this desire for this sarata, for a union with us, to be with us. And so because of that, we became this asoka dasika. We became your, your unpaid maidservants. Mm -hmm. And it, it's so bad. For, how are we unpaid maidservants? 
First of all, you never gave us anything for our services. Secondly, we're your maidservants, but our parents never gave us to you in marriage. Mm -hmm. And although we were never willing to marry you, the gopis are thinking in the sulkiness, huh? our parents still, they should have given us to you in charity. It, that would have been proper, but, but they didn't do that. So therefore, we're Asoka Dasika. And this murder is so terrible. It's one thing if you murder someone, if you murder a criminal, that's very bad. If you murder an innocent person, that's even worse. But what if you murder someone who's just humbly serving you? And so this Kimvada, what an unprecedented murder that you've done. Because we're a Sulka Dasika for three reasons. First of all, because you've never given us anything. You've never paid us anything. Secondly, if our parents would have given us to you, then you could say, yes, they're, they're my maidservants. But my parents never gave us to you. Thirdly, even if we wanted to marry you, and of course we don't, the gopis, the left-wing gopis are speaking like this, huh? Uh, uh, then maybe you, we could have had some Gandharva-style marriage where we exchanged some garlands or something, and then you could have called us your dasis. But you also never did that. Huh? So we're a Sulka Dasika, and this is the most extreme, terrible murder. You're going to murder someone who's humbly serving you, and it's not, not just someone you're paying to serve, but you're not even paying us. A Sulka Dasika. <laughs> so beautiful. It's... In one sense, uh, and this is a big, this is a big theme which we want to or not want to go into. See, generally, most uh, one of the biggest, most troubling questions for people is why do bad things happen to good people? And in many ways, uh, it is you could say it is a question about not our God's goodness. And there is that famous book written by the Jewish rabbi who said that when God bad things happen to good people, actually God doesn't want those bad things to happen, but God is not in control. I think God is not in control. God is all good, but he's not that, all that for rabbi, good. his name was Dr. Harry Krishner. Krishner. <laughs> <laughs> Easy name to remember. <laughs> so I didn't wrap. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now. I read his book. It's quite a compassionate book. But he's basically what he's trying to do is he's trying to get God off the hook. That don't <laughs> give up, <laughs> don't give up your faith because you are not being protected by God. Even though, and he says yes, God wants to protect you, but he can't. So they try to show that how God is, uh, God is good, but right now devil is more powerful. Eventually, God will be more powerful and he will save you. But in one sense, if we see. The Bhagavatam is also incident after incident of bad things happening to good people. Hmm? It is a Parishad Maharaj, a good person, he's, he's cursed. He's cursed and he has to die. And like that, we can take one incident after another and say another. Dhruva has done nothing, but he is so terribly insulted. <clears throat> Similarly, we have uh, Chitraketu. He is, he is cursed, or he's just, he's just, it's a, it's not a laugh of derision. It's a laugh of appreciation or amazement. He gets cursed. But the point I was thinking is in the Bhagavatam, so the normal theological strategy is to try to separate God from the distress. And say God is not causing it. This distress is happening to you. And God is, God is different. God will save you. But in one sense, as the Bhagavatam moves deeper and deeper, it is the source of suffering becomes more and more clearly the divinity itself. Like if we see Bali Maharaj, he gives everything in charity. He gives three steps. In one sense, the Lord cheats and the Lord arrests. And when you're speaking about, uh, this is the most terrible murder, there is that verse where Bali Maharaj says that, you know, uh, what is that? Pumsham Lagdetamam. That nobody has punished anyone like the, the way I have been punished. So, the, and in the heart of the Bhagavatam, it's like not only are bad things happening to good people, the gopis are greatest people, but the bad things are directly done by God. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of separating theologically God from the bad thing happening, it's like the Bhagavatam as it's progressing, it is bringing a greater and greater almost union or direct causation between God and the bad thing happening to someone. But I think it's 
in the bhakti sutra and bhakti sutra somewhere it is said that when there is every relationship every reason for a relationship to break and it doesn't break that is real love ujjwal nilamani ujjwal nilamani okay so so in one sense the bhagavatam is through this this story is it's demonstrating the purity of the love so at one level for the gopis it is at least with respect to bali maharaj you can say okay you didn't honor your word although he could also argue that you know it is you who asked a deceptive promise you asked for three steps but you expanded yourself but at least okay you can for name sake you did something wrong that's why you, i did something wrong that's why i'm being punished but with respect to the gopis it is not even for name sake they have done anything wrong they just completely offered themselves to krishna and then that very krishna to whom they have offered he is causing them such suffering right? mm-hmm. so of course from a devotional rasik perspective we understand that they are experiencing the highest ecstasy in separation from krishna but that this when the suffering comes upon someone that to see, i think there's a lecture prabhupad where prabhupad says that you know a devotee says krishna has come as this disease or krishna has come as this pain so it's a very exalted realization to think like that but even when so the bhagavatam is through this like direct krishna causing the suffering of the gopis is it is actually demonstrating the exaltedness of the love of the gopis that even when krishna the very object of love causes us suffering and that's that's the you could say the greatest reason to just stop loving that object but the gopis don't do that and in that way their exalted love becomes manifested wow i could i could i offer some comments or reflection on that prabhu ji please, please please jump in uh I, i i at this point somebody listening to all this this uh gopi geet materialings and they may be thinking wow this is really sweet and i can do like that also and all chastise krishna and he krishna is being a rascal and krishna you're trying to kill me and, and this and this but we should be very very careful krishna he says in the bhagavatam the paroksha vadarishi a paroksha mama chapriyam that i like this paroksha vad paroksha vad means one thing is said but another thing is meant and so although it appears that the gopis are saying they're abusing krishna in the harshest way actually their words are the most wonderful words of love and th- this is an expression of their love and we should understand that just like sometimes bhakti siddhanta saraswati says in one place that if we see the guru chastising a disciple we may say yeah, that guy is such a rascal i saw him publicly chastise him they said don't do that because you don't know his chastisement might have been a, a reflection of his love so sometimes we very cheaply in our neophyte position we try to imitate the gopis and we try to criticize krishna it was a very very dangerous thing i've been reading some articles recently from bhakti vinod thakur and uh i i find it very very interesting some of the things not just the things he's saying but his mood and i think it's something a lot of devotees are not aware of and it's very much also in line with this point a, a theme that i found many times in these articles of bhakti vinod thakur which is a theme that we don't think about a lot of times because we're followers of shila bhakti siddhanta the singer guru who didn't compromise and was very cutting and very heavy but bhakti vinod thakur in other articles he speaks in a nice way even about uh, ram krishna who uh, is someone we don't appreciate very much he speaks here in jagannath puri radharaman charandas baba ji who started this nitai gor bhajan nitai gor radhi sham mantra which shila bhakti siddhanta was very unhappy with bhakti vinod thakur was friendly with him and bhakti vinod thakur said see, and when he wrote about ram krishna so called paramahamsa he said i don't we don't agree with him but we should accept that he's a sadhu and i find it very very interesting and in light of this thing too that that, that with the gopi geet that we may say all oh, the gopis are chastising krishna so that i can also do like that or prabhupad chastises certain people so i can also do like that but we have to be very careful not to imitate and i'm not advocating that that someone speak like in this way or in that way that's an individual thing according to what guru and krishna inspire you and instruct you to do but it's not that we should just blindly imitate the gopis and their chastisement of krishna or even chastisement of other devotees because prabhupad chastised someone or because shila bhakti siddhanta chastised someone therefore we should all chastise but as we were mentioning discussing before we started the podcast today 
Srila Prabhupada said a lot of favorable things about Islam and about the Quran, and he speaks about the Quran as a bona fide shastra. So devotees sometimes they may chastise the members of Islam, but Prabhupada didn't see fit to do that. So my point is being that, that we should be careful not to imitate the gopis, not to imitate our guru janas, and run around and chastising everyone. It's a lesson I see from, from this verse. Yeah, that's, that's quite a comprehensive analysis here. In one sense, the, a close level of love, a close relationship gives liberties which uh, outsiders cannot take. And in fact, outsiders, uh, they will, it'll be, it'll be disrespectful if they do that. So the, the Gopas, Krishna carries them on his shoulder, shoulders and their legs touch Krishna's body. We can't imitate that and let our feet touch, touch anything sacred. So, yeah, that's true. Reading Bhaktivinod Thakur's articles, I, I'm so impressed by it. He, Bhaktivinod says a lot of very far out things. And he's, mm -hmm. he's produced a lot of amazing books. That would be a whole podcast by itself to discuss. And I don't want to go there right now. But one of the articles that he wrote in Sajjana Toshani was about the appearance days and the dates of the six Goswamis, their appearance and when they did certain things, when they disappeared. And he presented a whole article about it. And then at the end of the article, he said, this is the best that we've been able to figure out historically. If somebody else can correct us, Please write to us and we'll print your, your points. Wow. But he, he's not presenting himself as an absolute authority. Mm. That, that's a very fascinating thing to me about Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And he's very respectful mm. of all the different sadhus. And of course, he, he was presenting this side about Hid Hari Vangsa. Well, by the way, did it hit, is it true that, that the followers of Hid Hari Vangsa, do they follow Ekadashi or not? Sometimes so they, follow the Ekadashi, they follow Ekadashi till a certain point. In the sense that, so their point is, um, so so their point is, if on the day of Ekadashi, I get prasad of Radharani, Radha and Krishna, am I going to say that, well, today's Ekadashi, so I'm not going to accept the remnants of Radha Krishna, or am I going to understand that the fruit of all my Ekadashi vrat <laughs> was to come to a point of accepting the remnants of Radha and Krishna? That's their point. It's similar here in Jagannath Puri also. There's many Vaishnavas who they fast from grains on a Kadasi, but if Jagannath Mahaprasad comes to them, then they'll accept that. And of course, in the book, which we which is accredited to Jagannath Pandit, the Prema Vivarta, which was discovered by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, there's a long discussion about how Gaudiyas won't even accept. They'll, they'll take a Tulsi leaf or something, but they won't accept Jagannath Mahaprasad on the day of Akadasi, but some Vaishnavas here do. And what's interesting to me, especially, is, is Radha Raman Charandas Babaji, who Srila Bhakti Siddhanta used to put his fingers in his ears <laughs> when he would hear the people chanting that mantra. He really didn't like it. But Bhakti Vinod was friendly with him. Mm. And for devotees, I find that kind of a revelation. I'm not trying to say, speak against my, my para, para Guru Dev, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati, Hare Krishna. But my point is just that there's different perspectives. It's not that Bhaktivinoda Thakur was wrong. It's not that we should reject Bhaktivinoda Thakur <laughs> because Srila Bhakti Siddhanta had another mood. Bhaktivinoda Thakur was very respectful about Hidhari Vamsa. He presented this history according to the Gaudiya side. And thank you for explaining a very fascinating topic. He presented it from the Gaudiya side, but then he said we shouldn't criticize him. And he's a sadhu. And, and he was, had the same mood toward uh, Radharaman Charndas Babaji and other Vaishnavas too. And, and even, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, I was mentioning it, that, that uh, this, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ram Krishna Paramahansa. Yeah. Bhaktivinoda Thakur says he's a sadhu. And so we give respect. We don't agree with him about many things, but he's a sadhu. Amazing. Cool. And this met about historical methodology also, bro. It seems Bhaktivinoda Thakur, what he wrote in Krishna Samhita about <laughs> separating the transcendental from the, you could say, empirical or historical. And that seems not just, he did it in a very sustained way in that book, but it seems that that was his approach in other issues also. And if you see that way, even when he established the authenticity of the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Yogapit, it was his personal conviction came from his vision, but he didn't expect others to accept his vision. 
he provided them empirical evidence uh, arch- architectural evidence and uh, various kind of archaeological and other kind of evidences so he does seem to give due deference to other pramanas also and so, mm-hmm. so, so beautiful so the gopis are uh, burning in the fire of separation <laughs> <laughs> they are burning in the fire of separation uh, but in that burning um they are expressing the, the highest truths of divine transcendental love i would like to show uh, a wonderful insight into krishna's loving heart <laughs> yes. because we are we are uh, speaking about how krishna is a thief and he is a murderer as shri pad madhavananda <laughs> prabhu was saying that side of krishna but, mm-hmm. but then uh, uh, krishna also has uh, you know this the sweet heart actually he is the sweet heart so here's a very wonderful verse that uh, i was reminded of um shripad madhavananda prabhu was making couple of points he mentioned point number 1 about uh, how uh, krishna is not the bad guy you know although the gopis are speaking uh, krishna has a very loving heart that's that's point number 1 and then also he mentioned about viveka shunya prem quoting from shila jeeva goswami how there are different levels of Uh, separation felt by the uh, vrajvasis so this is uh, uh, such a wonderful wonderful verse from the shrimad bhagavatam this krishna is telling uddhava to go to brindavan and i would like to uh, if 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 i have your permission chetana charan prabhu maybe spend a minute or two explaining this verse um, yes, it it gives a very very beautiful insight to how krishna thinks even when he makes a point even when he is speaking something how sweetly krishna is speaking so i will recite the verse gachodhava vraja saumya pitror nau preeti mavah gopinam advyogadhim matsandeshair vimochaya so we will see the general meaning of this verse and then we will see the inner hidden uh, nectar so gacha means go uddhava o oh, uddhav go so uddhav's question would be where vrajam go to vraja and then there's a word you saumya saumya means oh handsome one <laughs> or oh oh tender hearted one oh beautiful one oh handsome one right so krishna is calling uddhava handsome and soft hearted here and he tells him go to brindavan so it's very interesting he when we make a point we say uddhav you should go to brindavan right that would be the order of our discussion but that's not how krishna is saying even with, before he says uddhava krishna says gacha gacha in, and it's not gachatu so in sanskrit you can have different ways to say it you, you can you can say uh, gachatu yeah so um, which means when you use respect you say oh please go right but gacha is not that kind of an address gacha means go it's like telling an equal go go it's not please go uh, you know it'll be nice if you go you may want to go as they say in america right no, nothing of that so it's like go who uddhav go so gacha uddhav uddhav doesn't even know go where vrajam go to vraj vraja vraja vrindavan or uddhav run and then he says handsome one saumya we'll come to that in a bit then uddhav is asking krishna you know you are telling me to go to brindavan what am i supposed to do there krishna says pitro to my parents parents right and the word used is no not my parents our parents very interesting our parents what what to do there preetim love avah give give them love hmm you 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 take my love to them so some questions could be asked here why is the word pitro used mm-hmm. with respect to now our parents actually nanda and yashoda are not uddhav's parents they are krishna's parents why is krishna telling uddhav our parents which means point number 1 when you give them my loving message don't think that they are my parents speak to them as if they are your parents also 
just like you would speak to your parents you speak to my parents or another meaning is even if you don't consider them to be your parents my parents are so wonderful they will consider you as their child just like they consider me with affection they will consider you as affection so even if you don't consider them to be your parent they will treat you as their child and also the word now pitru now our parents in the plural sense is used out of respect because krishna has not seen nanda and yashoda in a long time so gacha go uddhav go to vraja oh handsome uddhav go to vraja and do what carry my love to our parents carry to our parents okay so he speaks about the parents here no mention of the friends no mention of the cows then he goes to the gopis and what is he saying gopi naam in the plural sense to the gopis who are they mat viyogadhim they are burning in the distress from my separation mat word has come here hmm? mat means me gopi naam mat viyogadhim they are feeling separation from me plural sense gopis mat and then what does he say vimochaya relieve them but not just relieve them mochaya means relieve vimochaya means relieve them of the pain and give them happiness both vishesha mochanam and how do you do that mat sandeshai now krishna has already said mat gopi naam gopis are mine and the separation is from me therefore what can you do uddhav you can do nothing except carry my message mat sandesha so the word mat has come twice the gopis are mine krishna doesn't use the word mine for parents he says parents are our our parents <laughs> uddhav speak to parents as if they are our parents but gopis mat viyogadin they are separated from me and therefore mat sandeshaihi only my message can help them but interestingly the word sandeshaihi is in the plural sense which means krishna is giving only one letter so why is saying plural or oh, uddhav you just read my message you don't use your intelligence for the parents he says carry my affection and love them but as far as gopis are concerned you can do anything it's only my message which is going to work and i give you one letter you read it in front of them if it doesn't work read it again if it doesn't work read it again if it doesn't work read it again if still doesn't work read it again so mat sandeshaihi the plural sense has been used gacha go uddhav to vrindavan oh handsome one go and to our parents speak to them as if they are your parents or even if you don't speak to them as if they are your parents they will still treat you like their son to our parents carry my love or use your intelligence your son your disciple of brihaspati you know how to articulate it you affectionately speak but as far as gopis are concerned who are in separation from me only my messages by repeated reading of my messages don't add your ifs and buts there uddhav so now it's interesting krishna is giving message to uddhav and telling about parents and telling about gopis what about friends what about the trees and this is where shripad madhavananda prabhu's point of viveka shunya prem comes in the trees of brindavan they don't even know that krishna has left <laughs> shila rupa goswami is saying they love krishna viveka shunya without any power of discrimination krishna has gone to mathura but the tree in kumudwan is thinking krishna is in talwan because he has not come to kumudwan today and the trees in talwan are thinking krishna is in madhuvan because he has not come to talwan today and the trees in madhuvan are thinking krishna is bandiravan and the trees in bandiravan are thinking krishna is in lohavan and the trees in lohavan are thinking krishna is in brindavan and the trees in brindavan are thinking krishna is in radhakund everyone is thinking today he is in another forest maybe tomorrow he will come so therefore they don't even feel the separation because they don't know krishna has left so krishna is telling uddhav don't go and tell the trees my message because they don't think i have left and as far as my friends are concerned they have hallucinated so much <laughs> that they are thinking that actually they are playing with me but they are actually playing with my hallucination and they are happy <laughs> so don't go and read the message to them and break their hallucination and give them distress they are happy my friends are happy 
they are so much in separation that they are hallucinating and that hallucination of my presence they think is me so they're happy and they're playing with that hallucination so don't go and read my message and break that but as far as the parents are concerned and as far as the gopis are concerned they don't want to do anything with the hallucination they actually want krishna so just go and speak to them and between the two go and use your intelligence in speaking to my parents but that's going to fail when you speak to the gopis you when someone has a hat and they have to look up on the on the the height of a of a building what happens is that when they put the hat on and they try to look up and how how tall the building is the hat will fall to the back so uddhav you have the hat of scholarship but when you look up at the height of the gopi's love the hat of your scholarship will fall <laughs> so your scholarship will fail there <laughs> it will fail there so don't speak your logic to the gopis just speak my words so then uddhav is still thinking but i don't know whom to go and give my message to who is that person whom i'm going to speak and that answer is given in the brahmar git in canto 10 chapter 47 text 20 uddhav sees shrimati radharani speak to the bumblebee and what is she singing priya saka punaraga priya sa preshita kim varaya kim anurundhe mananiyo simenga nayasi katamihasman dustyaja dwandva parshvam now here's the word satata murasi saumya shri vadu sakamaste it's almost like saumya is the only word that uddhav didn't understand why krishna would use it but krishna had encrypted his message you have to go and give my message to that gopi who has the key to the encrypted message so krishna gave the encrypted passcode as saumya and shrimati radhika uses the same word saumya here so uddhava is observing radha he doesn't know when he comes to brindavan whom to give the message to and he sees shrimati radharani speak to the bumblebee and use the word saumya and something clicks there wait a minute that's the only word that i didn't understand from krishna's message even my gurudev prashpati doesn't understand krishna's message that's the only thing that i didn't learn in prashpati school of higher education so i had to come to vrindavan vihe vrindavan institute of higher education i didn't learn it with prashpati so that higher education i will get in vrindavan so uddhav is thinking the saumya doesn't make sense to me but when radharani said saumya he understood oh 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 krishna encrypted the whole message with the password the passcode saumya and radharani has the key to it saumya so i am supposed to give my message or read krishna's letter to this gopi so the point is this whole discussion the parallel between these two verses shows the heart of krishna how he is equal to uddhav sending him to braja calling him beautiful but that's also a hidden encrypted message passcode how he's caring about his parents how he's caring about the gopis and possessive about them and is ready uh, to use the word mad twice now no good poet will use the same word twice in two pa- in two consecutive lines it's it's the fault of re- redundancy repetition is considered to be a fault of a bad poet but if krishna is using it it is to show his possessiveness of the gopis so how can krishna who loves the gopis so much how can he be a thief how can he be a badmash how can he be a bad man how can he be a murderer when he loves his gopis so much so i am showing all this to present from as a lawyer from krishna's side that krishna is not as bad as uh, <laughs> the gopis are portraying him to be he is only uh, the 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 sweetest heart that anyone can ever imagine so Wonderful. Sorry for blabbering on and on for I think <laughs> more than twenty minutes now. It's beautiful. Hmm. So, Madanthu, what should we do? Madanthu, it's you said midnight for you. It's past midnight now. So, I think we should hear the conclusion of everything. A review from the lotus mouth of, of the uh, monk for his podcast. Uh, you want to add some words to it when I try to summarize? You just what Madam Andrew? Anything you want to say before that? No, I, I'm good. I'm really happy that that was wonderful from Amarinder Prabhu. Thank you so much. Really appreciated that. I my my kind of conclusion I just offered before, and and I can repeat it for a moment again that that we should be very careful not to try to imitate the gopis 
mm. and try to chastise Krishna and imagine ourselves as being so elevated in the same way that we shouldn't imitate Gurudev and start trying to chastise other people when we see them chastising them. And a uh, beautiful example is Hidhati Vangsa, even though we've heard that. Another example, again, is the, the, the Vallabha Sampradaya, that there's very many harsh things the Godias have to say. I'm very reluctant to go there and speak that thing. I, I, I have very good friends, God brothers, who come from, from that, that line, and they have a very different understanding. And it's okay. In one sense, you could say both things are true. Because Bhaktivinoda Thakur says something, Chaitanya Chaitamrita says something, we can accept it from them. I'm not going to argue with them, as uh, Amarendra Prabhu said, he's not going to argue with Bhaktivinoda Thakur. But at the same time, Bhaktivinoda himself says that uh, in some of his articles that I, I've said this, but maybe somebody else has some other evidence. Or something, maybe someone can correct that. It's not, he's not presenting all those historical things necessarily as being absolute. And I, I think it would be a mistake for us to also start chastising Krishna like the gopis did, or chastising other people in the same way Prabhupada did sometimes. So, then. Mm. so thank you. That's a very important point. It's Can I add and, something, Prabhuji, in line to that? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of that pastime where Nityananda Prabhu and Advaita Acharya get into a transcendental oh. argument. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting that Srila Vrindavan Das Thakur at that section of the Chaitanya Bhagavat, he says, anyone who takes sides with Nitaya against Advaita <laughs> or Advaita against Nitaya will be doomed. So um, taking sides with the gopis against Krishna and criticizing him or taking sides with Krishna and saying that the gopis are being unreasonable. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's both uh, the path uh, for our deformation, not Krishna's it's, deformation, but our... <laughs> it, it's shallow. Right. Shallow thing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And also yesterday being Sharad Purnima was the disappearance day of Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, uh, who was the sannyas guru of Srila Prabhupada. And something very interesting from his life that Prabhupada Saraswati Thakur used to respectfully deal with all his disciples. He was very respectful, very kind, very gentle to all his disciples. But to Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj, who was Vinod Bihari Brahmachari, he used to call him a fool. <laughs> he used to call him a fool. Now, externally, it may seem that, oh, Srila Prabhupada Saraswati Thakur is uh, chastising his disciple. But it's very interesting. It's out of affection. He used to, he used to call Vinod Bihari Das Brahmachari, and he used to say that you joined me when you were 17. And all the money that you're getting, you're giving it to me. You must be a fool. At your age, you should be outside making money in the outside world. And keeping all that money for yourself. What a fool that you're giving all that to Gurudev. <laughs> so that's actually uh, the highest compliment. It's higher than just saying, oh, you're doing good. Like Srila Gaur Govinda Maharaj used to say that Guru can take two roles. He can, he can teach and he can cheat also. He can cheat also. So sometimes the Guru may give Shabashi on the back. Wonderful. Very nice. And we may think that to be the only part of his mercy. But sometimes he may chastise heavily. That's when Guru is actually giving his mercy. That's when he's actually giving his mercy. He's, doing, he's giving Kripa to his disciple. So Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj used to be called a fool by his Guru Dev. Srila Prabhupada Saraswati Thakur. And that was his expression of affection in, in a sarcastic way to say that uh, certainly a person must be foolish to join me at 17 and not make money all his life and give all that money to me. How can, you know, you're being selfless, you're being surrendered and only a fool will do that. That's actually glorious. And in, in return, Srila Bhakti Pragyan Keshav Maharaj used to tell Prabhupada Saraswati Thakur, that, uh, yes, I am certainly a fool, and you are a ship <laughs> who has come in this world to carry fools around <laughs> across the ocean of birth and death. Because the ship has nothing to do with the ocean. But the ship just feels compassion to see the drowning people in the ocean of suffering. So you are the ship, O Gurudev, who is coming to carry us as fools who are drowning in this ocean across. So in that way, if you see, that also seems slanderous. How can a disciple speak to guru like that? You are a ship carrying fools around. But in their expression, that was the, the, the highest intimacy of um, mutual glorification and mutual love. So the gopi speaking like this and Krishna behaving like this is um, 
not to be seen from a materialistic perspective and, and take sides, but this is the explosion or the expression of greatest affection for each other. Just was reminded of this uh, from Sripad Madhavan and the Prabhu's discussion. Beautiful. Thank you. So, I'll try to summarize. And if any of you want to add something, you can try at the end again. So today, we can say broadly, we had two divisions. One was speaking from the gopi's perspective and the second was from you know, Krishna's perspective. So initially, we continued the metaphor of the stealing. So what is being stolen? So Krishna is actually, um, if Krishna can steal, even from a lotus, which is compared to a saintly person, a family of lotuses, like a family of saintly people, then how much are the gopis more vulnerable to be robbed by him? And... Then the thing, uh, so that theme of the gopis being robbed and how that's a terrible robbery, terrible form of robbery. We discussed that at multiple levels. How in the um, gopis are uh, normally if a thief robs, it's one thing to punish a criminal, it's another thing to punish a saintly person, it's another thing to punish a topmost saintly person, it's another thing to punish not just one but many gopis. Or from the other perspective, you can punish a wrongdoer, but to punish an innocent person is bad. But to punish a person whom you are serving is even worse. And here, it's like a person who is a criminal, who is a robber, eventually that person will, in the process of robbing, will go and kill also. So, Krishna is in that sense killing. <clears throat> so, I think Narayan Bhattu Goswami is calling that Kim Badati, and it is Katishyata Badati. It's the most reprehensible form of killing. And there was that beautiful picture which you showed us about how the gopis, how did they stay alive if Krishna is killing them? And how are they staying alive? Sanatana Goswami says that it is because, because for his sake, because they like their, Krishna is their life. And in that sense, Krishna was, uh, they stayed alive for Krishna, they stayed alive for Krishna's word and because they are completely dedicated to Krishna. And But how were they able to stay alive? Because it was that they became like turtles when the heat becomes very high, goes underground in the mud, buries itself and survives. So like that, the gopis, they, when they are afflicted by the separation from Krishna, they bury, him, bury themselves in his remembrance and that's how they are able to survive. And then, so this is, despite all this might make seem, Krishna seem very heartless, that Krishna is subjecting the gopis to such suffering. And there is that metaphor is there. Krishna is the greatest of thieves. He can be the sneakiest of thieves. He can steal from everything. So we had lotus, one side of the lotus as the robber. Krishna's glance is stealing the gopis' lies. And then we have also the lotus as the robbed. The gopis, uh, gopis are like the lotuses who are being robbed over there. So then we moved from that perspective to actually how Krishna is not a bad guy. Krishna is reciprocating in his own way extraordinarily. So... Krishna's heart is also torn between duty and love. Duty keeps him in keeps him in Mathura, whereas love wants him to come back to Vrindavan. Just like in Lord Ram's case, it was similar but opposite. Duty kept him in the forest. But Krishna, three four different perspectives. That so Krishna, when they meet in Kurukshetra, Krishna tells Radharani that every evening. How were you able to stay alive? Because I would come back. But first of all, I prayed to Lord Narayan and I prayed so fervently that he became pleased and he, he maintained your life. And then he asked a benediction for me. So I said, the benediction I want is, let me run at high speed to Vrindavan. So every night I came and you thought it was, a ch- it was just my spurti. But actually it was I really there with you and I would go back every morning, rush back. And that's how you maintain your life. And then you talked about various uh, levels of, or various, uh, is it levels or various forms of love, we can say. So with respect to the cows, they don't feel separation because there's Prem is Vivek Shunya. When Krishna's Purti comes, they think it's reality. But with the Utkanta Pradhan, the gopis, they feel the most separation because even when Krishna comes, they think it's a Purti. But Krishna does come and just like Lord Chaitanya would go and take the offerings from Mother Yesho, from Shichi Mata. So even Lord Krishna says that, you th- he tells Radharani that you think it is just uh, my chubby, that you had a dream about me, but actually uh, it is not a dream, it is a reality. The, 
the garments and the 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 the, the clothes have my fragrance so in that sense i was really there so that is krishna's loving heart is krishna deeply cares for the gopis and wants to be back then so you talked about krishna writing letters to radha writing letters to yashoda that in you cooked squid rice and it was, and i i know that was there you may think it was chavi but it is actually there so then we discussed about this theme of which is quite an important theme that the gopis at their level they are seeing krishna but they thinking that is not krishna uh i think it's just a hallucination kind of thing now we may have some vision and we want to claim that it is krishna who is there but uh, at we are seeing krishna but our devotion to krishna is is a very private affair it is gopayad guru matmana we shouldn't uh, share it with others we do at least not publicize it share it maybe with our guru only and prabhupad didn't approve when some lady said that jagannath was trying to take her, take her cloth so that is that kind of we have to keep our devotion private our guru that means our devotion is for krishna to relish and it like that pot metaphor the pot with boiling water can seem dramatic but the pot with water in it pot put on fire and it's steam coming out to everyone that's dramatic but the pot which is covered it is becoming more and more powerful so like that for all of us it is uh, that our when we keep our devotion private it becomes much much more powerful for us actually and then you went on to discuss about disrespecting others so the point was that <clears throat> when krishna in one sense uh, is krishna causing the suffering to the gopis it is he is manifesting as purti to give them relief but at the same time the bhagavatam depicts how Uh, it is bad things can happen to good people but it's far more worse when god is the god is making that bad thing happen directly <laughs> so but that past time uh, is demonstrating the gopis exalted love as told in ujjwal nilamani that when there is every reason to break that love but the love doesn't break so that that is the point of this past time and krishna also the gopis are saying krishna you're not reciprocating with us and we left our home our hiding place to come to you but you are gone to hiding So Krishna seems to be non-reciprocating, but that is like uh, fire purifying gold, so that gold becomes blazing more and more. So when the gopis seem to say that Krishna is like a thief, or even the commentators, they similarly may say something like that. Krishna, we have to be very very careful about um, about those kind of statements. We cannot take it cheaply, and we cannot chastise Krishna, or we cannot imitate uh, acharyas like Prabhupada and criticize. Uh, other vaishnavas because uh, we don't know the dynamics of the relationship and we can discuss the examples from vrindavan about you know, how there are other vaishnavas from other sampradayas who need to be very carefully respected and different acharyas have different positions on those issues and then towards the end you discuss the beautiful verse of how krishna is so concerned about uh, the vrajwasis in separation that went from dwarka uh, when he tells uddhava to go he says you go and gachcha it is 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 uh, eagerness that he goes so much that he is telling you go and you tell about you reassure my parents who will just be like your parents or who are our parents will treat them like your son only but then for the gopis you give my message and as those words mat mat sandesha that will sandesha give you again and again they so after the separation that And that those words will convince him and again the point is the gopas are in ecstasy in hallucination so they don't realize i'm separated and i'm away from them and the cows and the trees also don't because they are away question every but the gopis need to be pacified so krishna's love comes out here also in the sense of how the gopis are uh, he wants to pacify the krishna pacify them he's very concerned about them so the love is it is a very inconceivable lofty level of love where within that affection the gopis are chastising krishna and krishna also seems to be uh, krishna also seems to be doing something which are apparently for chastising worth chastising but there's a very transcendental level at which love is being reciprocated so thank you very much for anything you want to add quickly toward the end it was brilliant i, I the summary was so brilliant 
<laughs> I, I, I feel like Chitra Ketu Maharaj now, like laughing at Lord Shiva. Like you're in a position of Lord Shiva who's summarizing it so well. And I'm like Chitra Ketu laughing in amazement, sometimes even being misunderstood that why are you laughing? But I'm like just laughing in, <laughs> and smiling and giggling and chuckling in amazement that how could, just like Chitra Ketu was amazed that how could you keep Mother Parvati on your lap and speak on renunciation? I am amazed. How could you, you know, hear something for like two and a half hours and <laughs> retain all of that? in the same order with all those examples, with all those details, with all those stories <laughs> and with all those emotions and give the right conclusion. It's, you know, I would say that I'm amazed at your amazement. I can remember what I heard in the last two hours, but you have probably memorized things for 20, 30 years and you're able to draw them from your memory at any moment. It's amazing. So it's wonderful to have your association too. Thank you for your, uh, for sharing your heart filled with Krishna with us. Adant, in concluding words? Yeah. I'm just, I also would like to say thank you very much to both of you. It's Parasparanu Katanam Pavanam Bhagavad Yasa. We should learn to come together with devotees and have some discussions. And Krishna Kata is not like a, a lecture in the, uh, in the university. It's not like a sermon in the church. It's like a, not like a commercial on television. But it's meant to be paraspara, there should be some back and forth, otherwise it doesn't stick to us. And it's so wonderful that I get some opportunity to, to be with personalities like the two of you, even though I'm, if I say something humble, you're going to like both go bad, so I won't say anything. I'll just say We, we will say the question. same thing. <laughs> ne Hakim brother, why are you murdering us? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Prabhu. Look forward to continuing this next week. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank